Hi, I think and I hope we're uh, live on uh, both YouTube and Zoom, so I hope everybody can see me speaking. I'm Robert Massey, I'm Deputy Executive Director of the Royal Astronomical Society, and I'm here to act as MC for this lecture today. Um, this is the latest in our series of public lectures that we've been running actually for well over a decade now, and obviously it's only in the last uh, seven or eight months or so that we've been do, uh, doing these things on Zoom and online, but I hope that you know you are all enjoying these as we run through a program of really quite distinguished speakers over the uh, course of the year. Now, I'm going to now introduce today's speaker. Uh, I just need uh, to multitask on different screens just to check the biog. Uh, now, our speaker is uh, Professor Andrew Norton, who is a Professor of Educa Astronomy Education at the Open University. The title of his talk is Exploring the Variable Star Zoo, Citizen Science and Super Wasp. Now, Andrew is has a long career in astronomy has been doing it for several decades uh like me it makes all of us feel slightly older than we'd like to be but andrew um started uh, his phd or completed his phd rather from the university of leicester back in 1988 where he worked on x-ray astronomy and after a spell as a research fellow at southampton university he joined the open university as a lecturer in 1992 and he's now a professor of astrophysics education and he's developed things like uh, physics, astronomy, and space modules across the, the undergraduate curriculum. And his, time, his research focuses on time domain astrophysics, including compact interacting binary stars and wide field photometric surveys. He's also a former vice president of the Royal Astronomical Society. And uh, I was intrigued by this particular last uh, uh, expression. He has an Erdos Bacon Sabbath number of 13. Now, I haven't actually had a chance to look up and find out what that means. So, Andrew, perhaps when you uh, do your lecture in just a second, you could explain that to us. Um, the one final thing I need to say is there's a few housekeeping rules about this. You won't be able to, we won't be able to hear you if you're watching uh, unless you're either Andrew or myself as a, a so-called panelist, as a regular participant, that's not possible. But you can ask questions via the Q&A. Um, and so please, we encourage you to do that. I'll keep an eye on those. And then at the end of the lecture, in about 45 minutes time, we'll go through those questions. I'll read them out, say who's asking them, where I can see that, and we'll answer them in due course. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy Andrew's lecture. I'm going to uh, switch off my video now, mute myself, and hand over to Andrew when you're ready. Andrew. Thanks very much, uh, Robert. I hope everybody can hear me. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, and I've put my first slide up on the screen here. Yes, Erdos Bacon Sabbath number. It's all about degrees of separation in scientific publishing, in film and in music. Uh, three numbers combined. If you search for my web page uh, at the Open University, you can read a bit about it there. But it's about, yeah, it's all about degrees of separation from uh, Paul Erdos, from Kevin Bacon and from Black Sabbath. So there you are, something to read. Anyway, what I'm going to be talking about today is exploring the variable star zoo, uh, citizen science and super wasp. So here's uh, just an outline of what I'm going to be covering. I'll start off telling you uh, a little bit about uh, the super wasp itself, um, the, the project and, and, and what it is. Uh, I'll talk about how I've been doing searching for periodic variable stars in these super wasp data. And then I'll tell you about a project on the Zooniverse uh, web platform, which some of you may have uh, come across before, started off as a host for Galaxy Zoo, but is now a much more widespread uh, citizen science platform for a variety of scientific projects. I'll then talk uh, a little bit about some of the variable star science that I've been doing with these data over the years and, and perhaps set the scene for some of the things that, that may come in years to, to come as well. I'll, I'll talk about two sort of different types of science that we can do with these data. That's uh, namely, as it says here, population studies of whole classes of objects, where we're talking about thousands upon thousands of objects of a similar type, which we can examine um, if they behave in similar ways or different ways to each other and also studies of individual unique objects, as I'll show, because this is such a large set of data covering many millions of stars, we can hope to find and indeed do find some rare objects and possibly unique objects uh, amongst those. And I'll show you examples of both of those types of science that we can do with these data uh, as we go along. So SuperWASP, first of all, and SuperWASP was the wide angle search for planets. It was designed as the name indicates, as a, a means of searching for exoplanets, planets around other stars. 
uh, it uh, it operated from um, about 2003 through to 2012, something like that, uh, 10, 11 years altogether. And shown here in the photograph is one of the two installations. We had one in La Palma, Canary Islands, covering the Northern Hemisphere, and one in South Africa, covering the Southern Hemisphere, so that we could see essentially the whole sky. As you can see, there were eight cameras per instrument, and it's a fully robotic telescope. Each of the cameras has a very wide field of view, about uh, nearly eight by eight degrees. And remember, the full moon is only half a degree across. So these are really quite a wide field of view. So overall, each camera gives about 500 square degrees of coverage. And we have eight of them, uh, which are offset from each other. So the patch of sky we can image at any one time is really very large. The downside of that is that the pixel scale is quite large. So each pixel in the cameras covers about uh, 14 arc seconds. Uh, which uh, where one arc second is one sixtieth of an arc minute, which is one sixtieth of a degree. It doesn't sound a lot, but in terms of when stars are packed closely together on the sky, that can cause uh, issues. And with this setup, we were sensitive to observing stars from about magnitude 8 to magnitude 15. Remember, the, the limiting magnitude for the naked eye is around about magnitude 5 or 6. So these are all fainter than we can see with the naked eye. But the very uh, biggest telescopes, of course, ground-based telescopes, can see down to perhaps magnitude 25 or so, much, much fainter still. So these are moderately bright stars by astronomical standards. So over the course of the project, uh, 2004 to 2016, sorry, is the, uh, the, the more precise dates there. Over the course of the project, we observed about 31 million unique stars. And shown in the map here is a plot in, uh, on sky coordinates of the distribution of those stars across the sky. The color coding is just the density of stars. And the sort of U-shaped region running across the middle here is the plane of the Milky Way, our galaxy. Uh, where the stars are obviously much closer together on the sky. And because of that, we avoided the very densest regions of the galactic plane, the Milky Way, uh, they're blacked out here, because quite simply the stars there are too close together for us to separate them with this pixel scale of about 14 arc seconds per pixel. But nonetheless, over the rest of the sky, we observed, as I said, about 31 million unique stars and accumulated about 580 billion data points, that's brightness measurements of individual stars spanning about 11 or 12 years. The advantage of these data is that they have a long baseline, we're monitoring each star for, like I said, around about 11 or 12 years, but they also have a high cadence, by which we mean uh, we sample the brightness of each star very regularly, perhaps um, every few minutes during a given night, and then night after night, week after week, month after month, year after year. So these data, we say, have high cadence and a long baseline. And what we do then in an image, such as the one shown on the left, we, we measure the brightness of each individual star in each image, and we stack all those images together and extract the brightness of each star on each image. And from that, we create what we might call a, a light curve of that star, such as shown on the right. So in the top panel on the right, there's data from 2007 to 2014 of this one particular star. And each little black dot is an individual measurement of the brightness of that one particular star. That's just one of the 31 million stars that we monitored. The middle panel on the right then is a zoom in to uh, one month's worth of that data and you can see each sort of stripe is then an individual observing night and if we zoom in on just three nights worth of data as in the bottom panel you can begin to see that this particular star has a certain characteristic variation in brightness you can see it getting brighter and fainter and brighter and fainter in a kind of characteristic manner uh, of this particular type of variable star and that's what i'm going to come back to later on so we have light curves like this, as I said, for about 31 million individual stars. Now, what SuperWASP was designed for was to look for transiting exoplanets, planets that pass in front of their host star once per orbit, so causing a tiny dip in brightness. If we have a Jupiter-sized star passing in front of a, sorry, a Jupiter-sized planet passing in front of a, a Sun-sized star, that will block about 1% of the light and cause a little dip in brightness that repeats every time the planet goes round. So we can use that technique to search for these so-called transiting exoplanets. 
And over the course of its uh, lifetime, Super Wasp, so far we've found about 160 of these exoplanets in the data. There are probably still more to be found and we will continue to do that. But on the graph here, I'm plotting the orbital period of the planet on the vertical axis in days against the mass of the planet in uh, Jupiter masses uh, on the horizontal axis. And the size of the symbol indicates the size of the planet in uh, Jupiter radii. So you can see that most of these planets that we found with SuperWASP are Jupiter mass, Jupiter size type planets, but in very short orbits. They orbit their host star in typically one, two, three, four, five days, something like that. So these are what we call hot Jupiter type exoplanets. And SuperWASP has been probably the most successful ground-based project for finding these hot Jupiter planets. But, and this is now the point of my talk, SuperWASP is also good for science other than discovering exoplanets. As I said, there are about uh, 31 million of these um, stars that we've observed, and possibly up to a million of those stars are varying periodically at some level. Now, possibly, probably, most stars, all stars even, may vary in brightness at some level, if only we could measure them precisely enough. But at the level we can measure with SuperWASP, which is variations in brightness as small as about 1% or so, we can see that maybe a million of these stars are varying periodically. Now, there are, broadly speaking, two sorts of variation we can talk about. Intrinsic variation, where the star is physically changing in brightness due to a pulsation, an outburst, a flare, or something like that. And what you might call an extrinsic variation. For instance, an eclipsing binary, where we have two stars orbiting around their common center of mass. Each one periodically passes in front of the other, so blocking some of the light and causing a, a, a regular periodic variation in the brightness that we observe. Star spots on a rotating star would cause a, a similar sort of uh, variation too. But with these long baseline light curves that we have with SuperWAS, we can also look for variable periods. So we can look for uh, objects that have a period which varies in a systemic way, continue to get getting longer or shorter perhaps, that may be due to orbital evolution of a binary star where the orbit is getting uh, wider or, or, na or closer uh, with time as the system evolves. We can also look at periodic period changes, and I'll say more about these later on, but um, one such is a light travel time effect. For instance, if we have a pulsating star that is in itself part of a binary system, that pulsating star will be traveling away from us for part of its orbit and towards us for another part of its orbit. So the light from that pulsating star will take either slightly longer or slightly shorter to reach us, depending where that star is in its orbit. And so the pulsation period that we measure will appear, appear to be uh, a, a sort of faster period when the star is coming towards us and a slower period when the star is going away from us. So that's what we mean by a light travel time effect, causing a periodic change in a periodic variation that we measure. And we can also get in pulsating stars, for instance, as I'll show you later, uh, a sort of amplitude modulation or a frequency modulation of the primary pulsation, which then again varies with a longer period itself. And I'll show you examples of both of these as we go on. So, <coughs> excuse me. What I did a few years ago then was write a piece of software to search through all these 31 million light curves in a systematic way, looking for all the periodic stars, periodically varying stars that were there. I ran this on our Open University STEM faculty uh, computing cluster, a uh, little image of it there over about more than a year and a half or so. Uh, I divided the sky up into 360 batches, each one sort of one degree slice of the sky. And I was able to run 50 batches concurrently on 50 parallel computers here, uh, about 85,000 objects per batch, making up that whole 31 million objects in total. Now, processing each individual light curve only took about a minute and a half, but remember there are 31 million of them. Uh, so each batch took 90 days to complete. And in fact, the total processing time was 90 CPU years. Now, as I said, luckily, I was able to run 50 of these concurrently, so it didn't take me 90 years of human time to, to uh, realize this. Uh, it was all done in uh, just over a year and a half. But anyway, that's what I did, and uh, here's the results of that. So I'll talk you through these histograms. So if we look at the two histograms on the left, first of all, um, 
amongst those 31 million objects then, I found about 3.1 million, so that's about 10% of the objects, with periods. Um, and the graph on the bottom left is just a plot of the, the number of periods I found against the size of that period, and it's a logarithmic scale, so one hour on the left, then one day, one month, one year, and so on. And you can see in this graph on the left, there are lots of spikes corresponding to periods of, as it happens, one day, half a day, a third of a day, a quarter of a day, a fifth of a day, and so on. Uh, also multiples of one day, two, three, four, five, six days, and so on. A peak at a period of one month and half a month, and so on. These are all likely to be artifacts. The data are quite noisy because you may have seen the SuperWASP telescopes are very small. They're only 14 centimeters in diameter. So the data are quite noisy and there are what we call systematic effects, giving, if you like, fake periods close to integer fractions or multiples of one day or one month. And then in the uh, histogram at the top left, that's a cumulative histogram of the uh, periods. Um, there are uh, about 8 million periods then in these 3 million objects. And the big steps in this cumulative histogram are where we have these artifacts. So what I've done is essentially just it cut out and ignore all the periods close to one day, one month, and integer fractions and multiples of that. And that gives me the two graphs shown on the right. So uh, the bottom graph now is just the distribution of those periods with gaps corresponding to where I've cut the uh, cut the, the data out. And the upper graph is the cumulative histogram of those periods. So we now have, having cut out all those probably fake ones, about 770,000 objects, 2.5% of the total, with valid periods, with about 1.6 million valid periods between them. And you can see from that, I mean that uh, each object on average might have a couple of periods that we found. Some objects, just one period. Some objects may have three, four, five or more uh, periods that we found. But that's the data set that I'm working with then. About 1.6 million valid periods in about three quarters of a million, 771,000 uh, individual objects. And what I've done with those data, with those periods that I've found, is create a citizen science project. Um, on the Zooniverse website. And uh, what I've done is upload to there images of these 1.6 million light curves folded at those periods that I found. By a folded light curve, such as the one I show here, what I mean is uh, this particular object then has a, 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 an identified period of about 24 days. So I take 24 days of that light curve, overlay it on the next 24 days, and the next 24 days, and so on and so on. So I average together all the many, many cycles of variation to get this uh, this result. So in the image I'm showing you there, each little white dot is an individual brightness measurement, and the red line is the average of those um, averaged over many, many cycles that have been stacked together. Now, let me see if I can show you a live demonstration of this Zooniverse website. I've put the address there for you to go and try it out for yourself, and I would encourage you to do so. But let me just stop sharing this and share uh, another screen instead. No, nope. sorry, that's the wrong one. <laughs> let me share the right screen this time. Here we go. So here, hopefully, you can now see this web page, which is the SuperWASP Variable Stars project. Uh, and if you go to this website, you'll be able to log in uh, for yourself and try and do this uh, project. Um, there's a little tutorial which I can open up, which you can uh, work through, which tells you how to do it. And there's a, a sort of field guide of the various types of uh, stars that are available here. And what the aim of the project is, is to classify these light curves as either pulsating stars eclipsing binary stars of various types, which I'll, I'll explain later, rotating stars, some kind of unknown variation, or just a junk light curve. So pulsating stars, some examples here, they have a very characteristic shape of a, a sort of steep rise and then a shallow fall. Uh, these particular eclipsing binary stars show quite narrow eclipses, two eclipses per cycle, and the light curves are here repeated over two cycles uh, to help you see What's, uh, what's there. So there's some examples of these, uh, these types of eclipsing binary stars. There are another type of eclipsing binary star, which I'll talk about later, where the variation in brightness is much more continuous 
uh, and smooth as shown here. And there are rotating stars which have yet again a different type of variation. So the, the way this uh, operates then, you get a screen like this and the simple question is what type of light curve is this? And this one I think, well that looks like a pulsator, so I click pulsator and go to the next. Is this a pulsator at the folded at the right period or the wrong period? Well, it looks as though it's folded at the right period to me. So I click done and it shows me another light curve. This one looks like junk to me. I click junk. Another one, there's lots of junk in here. There's another junk light curve. And I knew I shouldn't have tried doing this live because probably all the ones that I try and show you uh, will be uh, junk. That one looks as though there's a some kind of variation there up and down. Maybe that's a, a rotating star. I'll click that. Um, that one looks rather noisy again. I call that junk. Oh, there's an awful lot of junk in here. There's a real one. Look, there's a nice smooth variation. Uh, that again is probably a rotating star. So I'll click rotator and carry on. Oh, that one looks like it might be an eclipsing binary star. You can see a, a, a really nice deep eclipse there uh, in the middle. And again, at the uh, edges, because this is shown repeated over two cycles. So I can classify that one. Anyway, I will, uh, enough of that, I'll stop sharing there and go back to my uh, slideshow. So there we are. Uh, hopefully then I've uh, given you a little bit of encouragement to go and try that for yourself. Please do. There are thousands of volunteers that have so far taken part. And in fact, just a couple of months ago, we just passed the 1 million classification mark. Now, that doesn't mean we're nearly done with this, because although there are 1.6 million light curves there, what we want is for each individual light curve to be classified by five, six or seven different people so that we can take the consensus view as to what is the most likely um, type of variable star each one uh, is. So there's still plenty more uh, for people to try. And uh, like I say, I would encourage you to do so if you've got a spare moment or half an hour to, to spare, go and take a look at the Super Wasp Variable Stars website and try classifying them for yourself. And as I show here, the broadly speaking, we've got pulsating stars, we've got eclipsing binary stars, we've got rotating stars, and we've got ones that are maybe of an unknown or junk type. So do have a go at that for yourself. What I want to show you, though, is some results of this. Now, the results I'm going to show you arose from uh, an original search that I did over these data several years ago now, based on only the first couple of years of data. So there were only a few tens of thousands of variable objects known at that stage. Uh, but nonetheless, we were able to do some quite exciting science with them. And I'm just going to show you, if I've got time anyway, four examples of the sorts of uh, project we, we got out of this. Two of them are going to be what I call population studies of classes of objects, and two of them are going to be case studies of individual quite rare or possibly unique objects. And we'll see if I get time to go through these. So I've mentioned already that there are various types of eclipsing binary stars, and astronomers broadly split these up into three types, uh, given the labels EA, Algol type binaries, EB or beta Lyrae type binaries, and EW, which are W Ursa Majoris type binaries. And broadly speaking, not exactly, but broadly speaking, the EA type are detached binaries, as shown in the upper cartoon on the left, uh, on the right hand side. EB are semi-detached binaries, as shown in the middle cartoon on the right hand side, and EW are contact binaries, as shown in the lower cartoon on the right hand side. And this degree of contact between the two stars affects how broad or narrow the eclipses are. So when we have a detached binary, such as the EA type, we get very narrow uh, eclipses that are well separated. When we have EW type, the contact binaries, we get a continuous variation in brightness as the two stars orbit around each other. And the EB type is obviously somewhere in between the two, and there aren't really strict dividing lines between them. Each class merges into the next. But broadly speaking, we have these three types. And what uh, we did a few years ago then was count how many of each type we could find in the SuperWASP data. And of course, we have far more now, but this is how many we found back then. Almost 3,000 EW type, about 5,000 EB type, and nearly 6,000 EA type. And just shown there in the histograms, you can see that the uh, contact binaries tend to have much shorter periods typically less than a day. The EA type tend to have much longer periods, typically several days, up to 10 days or so we might find. 
and the EB type binaries have uh, orbital periods somewhere in between the two. Now, what we did with these was measure not just the period itself, but how the period was changing over the course of the 10, 11, 12 years of data that we had for each object. And uh, just showing a, a little slide here to try and give an idea of how we did that, we plotted what we call an O minus C, observed minus calculated timing value for each star. Now, a uh, little bit of a complicated diagram here, but what we've got in red then in the diagram is imagine how a light curve of a star would vary if it had a constant period. That red line just goes up and down, periodically varying with the same period as time goes by. Shown in blue is a light curve where the period is getting shorter as time goes on. As you see on the, on the left, the blue line, the peaks are quite spread apart. And as it goes forward in time, the peaks get closer and closer together. So what we do in these so-called O minus C measurements is measure the difference between the observed minimum or maximum in the light curve and the calculated time where that maximum or minimum would be if the period was constant. And you can see that in this case, the blue curve where the period is decreasing with time, um, at time zero, our reference point, the uh, calculated curve and the observed curve line up. But at earlier times, there's an increasing uh, offset between the two. And similarly, at later times, there's an increasing offset between the two. It turns out that if the period is linearly increasing, we get a concave parabola when we plot these O minus C values. And if the period is linearly decreasing, we get a convex parabola when we plot these values. Let me show that to make it uh, a little bit more clear. So here then are two super wasp eclipsing binaries, uh, one on the left, one on the right. And what I'm plotting with the little red dots are these O minus C values, the difference between when the observed eclipse occurred and when we calculated the eclipse should occur if the period was constant. So the one on the left, you see this uh, concave parabola, that indicates that the period is increasing, in this case, by 0 0.1466 seconds per year over the course of about two and a half thousand days, which is, uh, what's that, about eight, eight years or something. The one on the right then has this convex parabola curving downwards at the sides, which in this case indicates a period decrease of this eclipsing binary of minus 0.277 seconds per year. Again, this is over the course of about 2,000 days, so that's maybe, uh, what, six years or something like that. So each of those clumps of red dots then is the data from one year's worth of observations. Okay, so why might we want to measure the rate of change of periods of these eclipsing binary stars? Well, because there's, there's another effect that we can see in some of them. And that's shown in the left-hand graph here, where we see a sinusoidal change in the O minus C diagram. This means that at some points, the period is increasing, and at other points, the period is decreasing. And that period is itself changing periodically. So this goes back to what I hinted at earlier, this light travel time effect. What we think is happening here, as shown in the cartoon on the right, is that we have uh, an eclipsing binary star, the two red stars shown at the uh, right-hand side of that cartoon. They're going around each other, giving these eclipses regularly every few hours or whatever it may be. But that binary star is itself in an orbit with a third star, so it's a triple system, the yellow star there, and that uh, binary star orbiting the, the third star then means that sometimes the eclipsing binary is coming towards us, sometimes the eclipsing binary is going away from us in its orbit. And this sinusoidal variation in the O minus C diagram repeats with a period of about six and a half years. So we what we imagine is happening here is that this triple system has an orbital period of six and a half years. The eclipsing binary and the yellow star orbit each other every six and a half years, giving rise to this sinusoidal variation in the O minus C diagram caused by the light travel time effect. Now, when we look at all those thousands of eclipsing binaries, and the three histograms here are the EA type, EB type, and EW type, we can plot 
uh, the number of systems in which the period is decreasing and the number in which it is increasing. And we can also measure the fraction in which it is varying sinusoidally. Now, amongst all the thousands of eclipsing binaries we measured, about 2% of them showed sinusoidal period changes. So about one in 50, 2% are almost certainly in these triple systems. But if we look at the, the rest of them where we saw period changes, about 22% of them, you can see from these histograms that the whether the period is increasing with time or decreasing with time is fairly symmetrical, about zero. So there are as many increasing in period as there are decreasing in period. And what we suggested is that these aren't actually linear period changes at all. What we're seeing when we see just a concave or a convex part of the diagram is a small part of a sinusoidal diagram like this one but with a much longer period. In other words, we just haven't been looking at these long enough yet to see that sinusoidal variation caused by the orbit of the third body. So if that's true, then that's telling us that it's not just 2% of these objects that are in triple systems, it's those 2% plus this other 22% where we only see a part of the triple system orbit. So actually 24% of the binaries are actually likely to be in triple or higher order multiple systems. So about a quarter of our super wasp eclipsing binaries seem to be parts of multiple star systems, which was quite a nice, nice result to come up with. The second example I want to show you is about a type of pulsating star called uh, RR Lyrae type stars. These are a, an evolved type of star which show pulsations, typically uh, with a period of about half a day or so. Um, as shown in the little cartoon on the bottom left, they physically pulse in size, getting larger and smaller, brighter and fainter, hotter and cooler as they do so, and give rise to this characteristic variation in brightness, this sort of sawtooth with a, a sharp rise and a shallow fall, as you saw in some of the uh, examples on the Zooniverse site. That's all very well, but many of these RR Lyrae stars show what's called the Blaschko effect. This was something first recognized almost, a, well, over a century ago now, which is an amplitude modulation or a frequency modulation of the main pulsation. And how it manifests itself, as shown in the graph on the right-hand side there, is a sort of spread in the brightness values when we overlay lots and lots of individual pulsations. So, this particular object then exhibits the Blaschko effect because there is a, an amplitude modulation of the pulsation which happens at a much longer period. The pulsation itself repeats every half a day or so, but there is a modulation of that which repeats every, so something like tens of days, 20, 30, 40 days or so. Now, we can try and identify that using a, a diagram like this. Now, this is a, something called a power spectrum. What we're plotting here is the strength of the signal as a function of frequency. Uh, the details of how we calculate this are, are not relevant, it's a mathematical technique to do it. But essentially, we search through the light curve to look for signals at different frequencies. And if there is a strong signal at a particular frequency, we'll get a spike, uh, as shown here in the diagram. Those green spikes are uh, strong signals uh, in this particular light curve. If one of these pulsating stars has a Blaschko effect, we will see multiple peaks. Not only will we see uh, a strong spike at the pulsation frequency, a period close to half a day, but we will see a lower frequency spike corresponding to this Blaschko period of several tens of days, a longer period, a much lower frequency. And we can also see what are called sideband peaks uh, given by the formula I show there. The, I think it's the only formula I'm going to show in this talk. One over the sideband frequency is equal to one over the pulse frequency plus or minus one over the Blaschko frequency. And what that means, as shown in the graph on the right hand side, is that we might see these sidebands, as we call them, peaks on one side or the other, possibly both sides of the uh, main pulsation frequency. And so what we did to say, well, if this is a genuine Blaschko effect star, we need to see confirmation from at least two of these extra 
frequencies, either uh, the low frequency Blazko peak and one of the sidebands, or both sidebands either side of the main pulsation frequency. And if we saw at least two of those three possible signals, as shown here, we counted that as a genuine Blazko star. And this is what we found. We found about 5,000 RR Lyrae stars in the SuperWASP data, uh, over 3,000 of which were previously unknown, and about 1,000 of them seemed to show this Blazko effect. Uh, and 600 of those were not, a, not only previously not known to show the Blazko effect, they weren't even previously known to be RR Lyrae stars. And of the nearly 1,000 Blazko stars that we found, nearly 900 of those were previously unknown. So we're kind of coming to the conclusion that this Blazko effect may be actually more common than uh, it might have been previously recognized. And possibly all stars, all RR Lyrae stars, all these pulsating stars show this Blazko effect if only you study them long enough and hard enough. Uh, and some of them are just at too low a level to pick out even in, in our data. So we're still not a lot closer to understanding what causes the Blazko effect but at least we've now recognized it might be a little more common than was previously known. And we've got several thousand more examples of RR Lyrae stars to study and about a thousand new Blazko effect stars uh, to investigate more. Okay, uh, oh, just a couple more slides about these RR Lyrae stars then just to show you uh, how this manifests itself. So about 20 of these extreme Blazko stars, uh, sorry, 20 of these Blazko stars show extreme amplitude modulation. And this is just one particular object uh, where I'm showing now in these seven panels, the, the light curves of this star over seven years between 2006 and 2012. And you can see that in some years, the light curve is much more variable than in other years, but there are these year on year changes. And if we zoom in to just one year in 2008, and look at these panels here. These are individual week by week changes. So each panel is a different week of data with again, several pulsations, uh, pulsation cycles within that week overlaid on each other. But you can see that some weeks like uh, week number 213 there is a very high uh, pulsation, a very smooth and steep pulsation. Whereas in week 218, just five weeks later, there's a much shallower pulsation. So this particular star is varying in its variability week by week and year by year. Uh, and so there's an awful lot going on in a star like this. So what I'm going to talk about next, uh, just two more examples to show you of some fairly unique objects that we've discovered. And this next one, I must say, is probably my favourite amongst all 31 million stars. Well, I haven't looked at them all yet, but the favourite one that I've found so far. It goes by this unremarkable name, one super wasp J09301.2.84 plus 533859.6. It's an anonymous star. Um, it has been previously catalogued by the Tycho sa uh, satellite, and it goes by the, uh, the names there shown as TYC. And Tycho satellite detected this as a double star, two stars less than two arc seconds apart. As far as SuperWASP sees this, with its, its sort of large pixel size, both stars are within the same pixel. So SuperWASP just sees this as a single point of light. But the two stars were previously known. They had the same parallax, which means they're at the same distance away. They have the same proper motion, which means they're moving across the sky uh, in a similar way. They're therefore most likely associated or gravitationally bound together. So we thought this may well be just a binary star system like many others I've shown you. But when we looked at the power spectrum of this star, we saw what's shown in the panel on the left here. And there are two sets of frequency variations going on. The one tallest spike labeled F1 corresponds to a period of about five and a half hours. And then the various smaller spikes labeled F2, 3F2, 4F2, 5F2, 6, 7F2, and so on they are what we call harmonics of uh, a rather longer period of about 1.3 days. So whatever is going on in this system, there are two separate clocks, if you like, one thing varying every four, uh, five and a half hours and one thing varying every 1.3 days. If we take that light curve and fold it at those two different periods, this, uh, this is what we see. 
Um, folding the date, whoops, sorry, folding the data at uh, five and a half hours, we see this smooth variation with uh, two eclipses per cycle, characteristic of a W Ursa Majoris type contact binary. And if we fold the same data at the longer period, 1.3 days, we see these alternate deep and shallow narrow eclipses that are characteristic of an Algol type detached binary. So this wasn't just a binary star. At this stage, we realized what we had was a quadruple star, a hierarchical quadruple star consisting of two binaries, one in which the pair of stars orbited each other every five and a half hours, and the other in which the pair of stars orbited each other every 1.3 days. Now, one of the things we can do with eclipsing binaries is uh, to use them to measure directly the parameters of the stars themselves, the masses and the radii. And we do that by taking spectra of the stars, taking many such spectra of the individual stars, measuring the Doppler shift of the spectral lines in those spectra, and plotting what we call a radial velocity curve as shown here. But this had a surprise for us. When we looked at the spectra of these stars, we saw that there were two pairs of stars, fair enough, and one pair, shown on the right, had uh, individual spectra that were varying and Doppler shifts going backwards and forwards every, um, every five and a half hours. But the other set was not two stars, it was actually three stars. So there was a pair orbiting each other every 1.3 days, but there was a third star, which was apparently not moving, at least on those short uh, timescales. So it turned out what we got here is not two stars, not four stars, it's actually five stars. And if you look at this, what we call a mobile diagram at the top right of the uh, slide here, it's like a sort of hanging mobile, this kind of illustrates the geometry of the five stars. So we have two binaries, one of the binaries is actually in a triple, and the triple and the binary themselves are then orbiting each other. And by combining these so-called radial velocity curves and the, uh, the brightness variation curves, we can work out all the sort of parameters as shown in the tables here, including the masses and radii of the individual components. So what this system looks like is probably something like this. And what it is, is a doubly eclipsing hierarchical quintuple star. So uh, shown in the cartoon there, uh, with a scale bar showing the sort of orbit of Neptune in our solar system for comparative scale, we have the contact binary, which would almost fit within the size of the sun. It's so compact and small, where the two stars orbit each other every five and a half hours. We have the detached binary, separated by a somewhat larger distance, orbiting each other every 1.3 days. That detached binary is itself part of a triple, and that triple star perhaps orbits each other every few years or something like that. We haven't observed it for long enough to measure that. And the triple star and the binary star then orbit each other with an orbital period of perhaps many decades or even centuries. But we wrote up a nice little press release about this when we found it. Uh, Marcus Law was a PhD student working with me at the time and he created this, uh, this little cartoon. But as I say, that's my favorite, I think, amongst all the stars we've discovered. I'll show you just one more uh, specific example before we finish of a different type of star that we found. And actually, this is that light curve shown on the left, which I, I showed you uh, several slides ago now, right back at the beginning. When we look at the power spectrum of this light curve, again, we see two sets of periodic signals. One relatively high frequency signal corresponding to a period of 1.784 hours and one relatively low frequency signal corresponding to a period of 5.104 days. And again, we take that light curve, we fold it at the two separate periods. When we fold the light curve at 5.104 days, we see a characteristic shape of an eclipsing binary star with a, a shallow minimum and a deep minimum. And if we fold the same light curve at the shorter period of 1.784 hours, we get this sawtooth shape characteristic of a pulsating star. So what we have here is a pulsating star as one component of an eclipsing binary star. And in fact, this very short period pulsating star period less than two hours is of a type known as a Delta Scuti star uh, named after the prototype uh, Delta Scuti itself. 
So it's a, it's a relatively high amplitude pulsating star with an amplitude of about a tenth of a magnitude sitting as one component of a 5.1 day eclipsing binary star. And again, we went away and uh, measured the spectra of these two stars to work out the Doppler shift and measure the radial velocity, which we could plot on a graph like this. And by combining the radial velocity curve with the brightness variations, we were again able to measure the masses and radii of the individual stars themselves. And this is important because these so-called dynamical measurements from an eclipsing binary can be used to calibrate the models that we construct, the computer models that we construct of pulsating stars. And if we know that pulsating stars in an eclipsing binary where we can measure the mass and radius directly uh, vary in a certain way, we can then transfer that knowledge to when we see isolated pulsating stars and use that information to infer the mass and radius of the pulsating star, even though it's not part of a binary star where we can measure the masses and radii directly. Okay, I'm just about at the end now, the end of my uh, 45 minutes. I'll just uh, summarize where we've got to at the moment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've currently got about 1 million classifications from uh, the Zooniverse website. We wanna keep that going till we've got several million, of course. But what uh, we're now in the process of doing is um, creating an interactive web portal to allow astronomers, both professional and amateur and citizen scientists astronomers, to search through the results to make their own discoveries. So having classified all the stars, we'll then put that into a, a, a web page where people can search for, let's say, all the objects with a period in this range, with a brightness in that range, and so on, uh, and find all the objects that meet their criteria that they can investigate further. And I have a new postgraduate student uh, working with me on this, Adam McMaster, who's just started uh, just started constructing this now. What we're anticipating is that this will allow a lot more research. So I've just put a few examples there. Searching for extreme examples within classes of objects. Um, and one thing I will mention, another postgraduate student I have working with me, Heidi Tiemann, she has found some really interesting systems which appear to be contact eclipsing binaries, but with very large, very long orbital periods of tens of days. Now, if these systems are in contact, but with a very long orbital period, they must be very large stars. In fact, they're probably red giant stars. So what we found, what Heidi has found, is a couple of dozen of these that are maybe red giant stars in close contact. And these may be the progenitors of a type of system that we call red novae, which may occur when the two stars, the two red giants, ultimately merge together. And uh, so that's something exciting that's come out. And these have just come out as an extreme example of a particular class of objects. We might also search for hierarchical multiple eclipsing systems, more like the quintuple system that I showed you just now. We might find more of these impending mergers by looking for systems where the orbital period is rapidly decreasing with time. And we might find more pulsating stars, such as R. Lyrae stars or another type called Cepheid variables in eclipsing binaries, which are very, very rare. And indeed, in some cases, not known at all yet. But that's the advantage then of this vast data set of 31 million stars, perhaps a million of which are, are variable. We can find rare objects. We can find uh, how whole classes of objects vary when we look at them uh, as a whole. And that's only possible with uh, mining these large data sets and uh, sort of mining data in astronomy is going to be a really big project in the next uh, decades to come, not just from archival projects such as SuperWASP, but new telescopes that are coming on the line in the next few years, such as the uh, Vera Rubin Survey Telescope, which will carry out the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, which will be a ground-based multi-meter diameter telescope monitoring the brightness of millions of stars night after night, year after year, for decades to come. So this whole time domain area of astronomy uh, will be a very important one as we go forward. I hope I've given you a little taste of that in the talk that I've given. I will just put up uh, some references there so that when, uh, if anyone goes back to look at the recording, they can go and, uh, and retrieve some of the published papers on these various things that I've talked about and indeed many more as well. But I will stop there now and uh, stop sharing my screen and
hand back to Robert to field any questions, if there are any. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, and thank you for that fantastic talk. We, we do have uh, questions both on Zoom and on YouTube, which is gratifying because it says your talk was going out on YouTube. So the recording <laughs> will definitely be there and people can see all your slides afterwards if they want to do things like check the references. So I'm going to be uh, looking through a few of them and picking them out. Um, mm -hmm. I know some people have asked several. I've probably, most people are probably going to get one shot at a question, okay. but we'll, we'll take it through. So first one is quite a general one from someone who's uh, going by the, uh, the online nickname of Alto Cumulus. And they say, what proportion of stars are classified as being variable? I would say probably, and I hinted at this earlier, I think, probably all stars are variable at some level. It's just how how finely can we measure that? At the sort of 1% level that SuperWASP can measure it, I would say it's something like a few percent of stars. But even the sun is variable if you look at it closely enough. Very slight variations in brightness that occur periodically. So all stars vary, I think, just some do it more than others. And the ones that we notice, I would say it's, it's, it's around a few percent. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, uh, someone, I suspect you won't be able to answer this easily. They said they say anonymous attendee, by the way, but they say, and perhaps the question I should change from their question to, to ask you, what do you think causes the Blaschko effect in pulsating stars? Well, usually when astronomers are faced with something that they don't understand, they wave their hands and say it must be magnetic fields. So I could say that. Um, it's, it's some physics going on deep inside the star that, that causes an instability. Uh, and it's, it's perhaps not surprising if there is, a, you know, there is a, a, a dominant mode of pulsation, which is every half a day or whatever. There will be some other modes superimposed on that, which modulate the, the period. And... Uh, so it, it's some some physical mechanism deep within the star, probably caused by varying opacity. Uh, the, the, that's the ability of the star to transmit or, or block light, which traps heat and energy within the star, then releases it, and it cycles in some way that we don't really understand. Um, but yeah, it, it does seem to be a very common phenomenon, and perhaps it's ubiquitous in all in all the R. L. Lyrae stars if we look close enough. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. There's a couple of related ones here. I think I'm going to take together. One is from someone described as anonymous attendee again, which is how can we identify the beginning and the end of the orbital period of a star and observing? And another one asking a slightly deeper question is what causes, e.g., the system generated periods of one month that you refer okay, to? Okay. So the first bit about identifying the beginning and end of the orbital period. Um, basically, we look for something that repeats. And if we see that repeated, pattern we can overlay uh, cycles on top of each other and um, yeah I mean it, it's not always immediately obvious that's why we we tend to need to look at a system for many cycles you know over several years if you like uh, to, to see exactly what the period is and it may be that the period is not terribly well defined but we can uh, you know if the more data we get hopefully the more easily we can see how that modulation repeats in a periodic manner it may not repeat there are there are certain types of stars that are called semi-regular variables they they vary you, you look at them you, you think they're varying in a periodic way but actually they never line up the cycles never completely repeat themselves so uh yeah it, there's a lot more going on in many cases for sure um the question about the one month uh, fake signals, if you like. Essentially, it's, it's due to the moon. You know, you've got the, the full moon comes around every sol uh, every lunar month and illuminates part of the sky, and that will cause sort of light leakage into part of the image. And, uh, you know, you can imagine if there's a little bit more background light on one side of the image than the other, that will translate through to a, a sort of slight uh, increase in brightness you might measure from the stars in one part of the image compared to another and that would repeat on this monthly cycle so it's uh, it's it's just you know systematic effects as we call them that uh, that we haven't completely taken account of okay thank you uh right there's quite a few coming through um trying to get through all these actually okay so there's one question I'm going to take together from uh, Philip Water, who is saying about, uh, I think he's asking questions partly about data sharing as well, and he'd be interested in sharing that with you. Yeah, no, I, I see his question there. So he mentions about the AAVSO variable star database, which, yes, it's, it's a 
big database, the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Um, so yeah, I mean, the whole point really of what I said about uh, us creating this portal to the Zooniverse classification results is so that we can uh, share those data. Um, because uh, at, at the moment, the raw light curves, the raw data are not terribly user friendly. Um, you know, we're, we're quite willing to make them available to, to anyone that wants them, but uh, the individual data are not necessarily easy to, to get to grips with in their raw form. But once we have this, uh, this interactive portal, which I'll say Adam is now uh, working on building, uh, then hopefully it will be a lot easier for people to search through the data and extract the light curves that they want and then uh, then analyze them uh, for, for themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. And from our YouTube channel, we've got a couple again I'll take together. Um, one is from someone called Max, who just says, how important is civic science and astronomy? And then from 10 dimensions, if you don't want citizen science, what's the scope for computer vision, deep learning in short yeah. and computer yeah. classification? I mean, the, there's a big, I mean, the, there's a huge role for citizen science, clearly, and the, the Zooniverse project in general has illustrated that across many areas of science. I think what's becoming now clear is that there's a complementarity between the citizen science and the machine learning as well. Machine learning is very good at churning through, you know, millions of data, if you like. Um, but machine learning can't always spot the unexpected things. You know, uh, we, we made a few videos about these actually with, with the OU and the, the, the example we used, if you've got a crowd of people and someone's dressed as a clown, you know, the machine learning might not recognize that as a person because they're so extreme compared to all the people around them. Whereas a human observer would say, well, hold on, that's just an odd human being dressed in a funny way. So in a sense, it's like that with the data, that the, the human citizen scientists can spot the unusual things that maybe the machine learning couldn't. And we can use them in a complementary way to, to use the citizen science classifications to help train the, the machine learning and, and spot the unexpected, if you like. So there's definitely room for both, yeah. Um, there was, was there another question there or was that it? Sorry. Oh, I think you, you've covered it. And then there's also, I'm going to take a couple of others from YouTube that are sort of related. One is from uh, Julian Onions, which is, will there be a super, super wasp planned? And then there's another one uh, from David Iannone, who says, when is the second data release and the catalog scheduled from the existing super wasp, I think. Right. So Julian, hello. I know Julian in Nottingham. Um, yeah, the, the, there is no replacement for super wasp it's the project has now finished um people that were behind it notably uh um don polacco at, at warwick and his team and and uh um andrew collier cameron at st andrews with the, the other players in in the project and, and people at keel university as well uh, uh we've all moved on to different things now and different telescopes uh the, the the warwick guys are running a thing called n n g s NGTS, Next Generation Transit Survey, uh, which is uh, operating in a slightly different way. And then, of course, there are all these other projects coming online, like um, the Vera Rubin Observatory I mentioned, the Zwicky Transient Factory, many other sort of monitoring telescopes, which are going to, you know, monitor the sky in a different way. But I think ultimately, you know, we will get to the stage where we're monitoring all the sky all the time. And then it really does become a, a, a an issue for how we mine those data in a in a in an effective way uh, that can't just rely on on human intervention. Um, and the, the question then about the second data release, yeah, I mean there was a first data release, as you say, we we were we, we had some funding to do that several years ago. Basically, we we just don't have any funding to do anything with the data anymore. I say I'm doing this with the SuperWAS Variable Stars project on Zooniverse uh, with a couple of postgrads, and uh, I, I fingers crossed I've I've got a bid at the moment for a couple of thousand pounds to build this um, data portal that we're hoping to build, which I mentioned, and that will be the Variable Stars data release uh, if and when we uh, we we get get the go ahead to do that. So um, yeah, uh, for now. The Zooniverse project is, is the way to uh, interact with the data, and there are 1.6 million light curves on there, so plenty to be playing with. And once we can uh, build this uh, this data portal, then hopefully there'll be ways for, for anyone to uh, investigate the, the um, classifications as a result of that. 
Okay, thank you. I think there's probably possibly time for one or two more questions now. Mm -hmm. uh, one is on Zoom from AEC. Are there any corresponding radio astronomy observations of these variable systems that yield synchronous mm -hmm. emission signals? Yeah, not that I know of. I mean, there are certainly equally there are radio monitoring projects such as LOFAR, the Low Frequency Array, which monitors the whole sky all the time in uh, in radio waves. Um, these the, the sorts of objects I've been talking about here, pulsating stars and uh, uh, eclipsing binary stars, tend not to be uh, radio sources. They're just regular stars in many ways. Um, radio signals tend to come from more energetic, more extreme events, possibly where we've got an accreting compact object in there, a, a neutron star or a black hole or something. Um, and so, you know, they will be radio, stellar radio sources. Uh, but these sort of eclipsing binaries and pulsating stars are probably not uh, going to be radio sources to any significant event, uh, extent. Okay, and I think I'll take this last one from Stephen R. As a, I can see there are a couple of others, and I'm sorry if people won't get to those, but you can probably email Andrew at the OU if you've got particular yeah. questions related to this talk. Thank you for that. Um, one last question then from Stephen R. To take us up to the hour is, how are these starlight, I mean, Starlink uh, yeah. swarms of satellites going to disrupt your ground-based observations? That's very timely. It is very I timely. I know you, Robert, are uh, very heavily involved in investigating this, and, and my postgraduate student, Heidi Tiemann, who I mentioned, is working with Robert on this as well. Um, yeah, these Starlink satellite swarms are probably going to be very disruptive for ground-based astronomy. Uh, they really are. Uh, we don't yet know quite how disruptive, but it might uh, it might well prevent any astronomy of this type that we've been talking about, or at least severely uh, disrupt it. So um, yeah, we need to uh, we need to investigate that properly and uh, engage with the people putting these satellites up and try and come to a, a, a way forward with them. And uh, so I know Robert and the Royal Astronomical Society are, uh, are leading that from the UK. So um, yeah, watch this space. All right, thank you. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time to give the talk uh, to be here today and to answer all the, so many questions that we had a real plethora there. And I can see there are quite a few people watching this live. And I know we, uh, we build up on YouTube over time as well as you'd expect, but we have now gone past two o'clock. So I will close the feed in a second, but just to remind you that we are also in National Astronomy Week. So if you want to find out everything you ever wanted to know and were afraid to ask about Mars, it's definitely this week, a whole range of really talented people giving talks. Um, the next one of which will be at six o'clock this evening. And they include, for example, Andrew's colleagues from the Open University, artists, poets, musicians, uh, lots of people, authors, lots of people with a general interest in the red planet. And it's on all this week. You can look up the National Astronomy Week website at astronomyweek.org.uk to find about that and the RAS will have another of these lectures next month roughly the same time in December and also we're running bicentenary lectures as well I can't possibly go through all the titles and all the speakers but have a look at our website and the events page and you'll find them there so with that I'll leave you to it and I wish everybody a good afternoon thank you and